All right, guys, uh, let's get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to whichever part, from whichever part of the world you're dialing in. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got a great response for this webinar. Uh, we've got 220 participants already um, and uh, more are joining as we speak. Um, my name is Praveen uh, Umanath. Um, I work at uh, BrowseTag as a product manager and also lead the marketing team. Uh, it's, it's my honor and privilege today to introduce uh, Simon Stewart, uh, who's going to be hosting or sort of presenting the majority of this webinar uh, with us. Uh, I think Simon is someone who needs no inter introduction. Um, he is the project lead for Selenium, uh, creator of WebDriver, and uh, co-editor of the W3C WebDriver specification, which he'll be talking about in detail today. Um, and um, I sort of introduced myself a little bit uh, earlier, so I, I lead the product team for our um, Selenium uh, automated testing product, Browser Automate, and also lead the marketing team at BrowseStack. So without uh, further ado, I think I will uh, hand it off to Simon uh, to uh, take over from here. Simon, all yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I am, I'm just reading the, uh, the messages as they scroll bar, and everyone introduces themselves from all over the world. Um, people in Nigeria, people in India, the UK, America, um, all over the place. It's amazing. Um, so thank you all very much for being here. Today's talk, we're going to go through um, Selenium 4 and um, all the new features and what makes it different and what makes it the same. Um, and hopefully at the end of it, you'll be in a, a good position to, uh, to start making use of, of, uh, of our new technology. So let's see, there we go. So um, the too long uh, didn't read, well, didn't listen. Uh, we're gonna cover why are we doing the major version bump. Um, we're gonna discuss the new Selenium IDE. We're going to talk about the fact that the user-facing APIs, so the web driver APIs that you've been using all this time are, are basically going to remain the same. So it should be a, a drop in upgrade. Um, but we're also going to talk about some of the new features that we're providing. Um, including integration with the Chrome debugging protocol, um, new mechanisms for finding elements in a friendly way. Um, and then finally, we're going to be discussing the, the sort of modernized Selenium grid. So that's the rough agenda of what we're going to cover. So the very first thing to bear in mind is when we talk about Selenium, we're talking about a family of products. Um, and the main ones are Selenium IDE, Selenium WebDriver, and Selenium Grid. So you might record your Selenium test in Selenium IDE and then run it uh, using Selenium WebDriver and then scale it up using Selenium Grid. Um, on the project, we described this as being a bit like um, Selenium, uh, like uh, John Malkovich in the film Being John Malkovich, where everything is called the same thing. Um, so uh, when we talk about Selenium, it, it can be a little bit imprecise. So in this talk, I'm probably going to be talking about IDE, WebDriver, and Grid. Um, and hopefully from context, it'll be obvious what Selenium is. So uh, kicking it all off, there is um, Selenium IDE. We have a new and refreshed um, Selenium ID, uh, IDE coming. Um, and that's largely thanks to uh, the hard work of the folks at Appler Tools, um, who base their, their project and the work that they've been doing on Selenium IDE on something that was created by Sidex. Um, so going back into the sort of dim and distant past, um, <clears throat> Selenium IDE gave us a nice record playback experience, right? Um, but it was written as a Firefox extension using the old XPI mechanisms. And over time, what happened is Mozilla changed to making everything be a web extension. And suddenly, Selenium IDE no longer worked. It didn't have access to the privileged APIs that it had before. And we were kind of stuck because there weren't many people working on IDE. In fact, in the end, it was just one person. Um, and then they ran out of time. And it was very hard for us to, to keep up. But the uh, folks at Sidex, um, they took the original Selenium IDE, they ported it to be a web extension, and they got it working, and they added their own enhancements. And then when we were looking around trying to figure out what to to do, um, Appler Tools came to us and uh, suggested that they would like to be involved with the project and what could they do to help. Um, and we went like, Selenium IDE would be really good because we're stuck. Um, and uh, they picked up and they, they did it. So Selenium IDE gives us a really nice record playback experience. We think of it 
as the on-ramp to the Selenium project itself. Um, it allows someone who isn't a developer to write tests quickly. Um, it allows somebody who is a developer to quickly put together um, the sort of basic frameworks of, of their test suites, which they can then use WebDriver for. Um, and it gives a really nice tool for people to, to file bugs with in a reproducible way. They can just record a, a test using Selenium IDE, um, add that to the bug report, and voila, whoever it is that's looking at a bug report can see everything that's going on. So um, things that make uh, Selenium IDE new and interesting, um, originally it was an XPI, then it became a web extension. Um, but one of the things we noticed is um, that people really like some of the newer tools that are coming out, um, in particular things like Cypress. And one of the ways that they get their capabilities and their abilities is to bind super tightly to the browser. In the same way that WebDriver bound to the browser in the first place to enable us to do various bits and pieces and, and was part of the browser infrastructure, um, the new IDE replacements and, and, and tooling has that same capability. And so um, the new Selenium IDE is, is going to be written as an Electron app. If you download it right now, it is a web extension. The Electron app is coming. Um, and as part of Selenium 4, that will be sort of one of the hallmark features, the sort of standalone app that you can use. Um, the way that the uh, Electron allows us to do a whole bunch of interesting things is enables us to use the Chrome debugging protocol to listen out for events from the browser. Um, and that's a super powerful capability because it means that we can do more stable locators uh, and, and, and we can track what's going on within the browser a bit more easily. Um, which is, you know, a really nice feature. Now, you could do these things from outside the browser, and in fact, it's perfectly possible to write incredibly stable Selenium tests without needing to be buried neck deep into the browser. Um, just by making use of the Chrome debugging protocol, we get a more sort of direct line into the state of the browser rather than having to treat the browser as a black box and intuit what's going on. Uh, there is new and improved niftiness uh, that we have. Now, nifty is a sort of, I think, fairly unusual British word, British English word um, that may not travel around the world. Imagine it as being cool or neat or fantastic. The uh, main things that we have are control flow. So previously, this was an extension that was added to Selenium IDE um, and being able to do, you know, um, if, while, um, uh, loops and fours and, and constructs like that were always hard to do. They're now baked into the basic grammar of Selenium IDE. Um, the other thing that we do uh, that Selenium IDE offers is backup element selectors. So I think we've all been in the situation where we've written a test and it's worked flawlessly. And then one of our developers or somebody has changed something um, and suddenly we've not been able to find elements and our tests have started failing. So what Selenium IDE does is while you're recording, um, it records not just one element locator, not just like an X path or an ID or a CSS locator. It records four or five of them. And if when you're running a test, it can't find the element using one locator, it will then fall back to trying one of the other locators until it finds the element you're looking for. And this is part of what we offer in order to help your test be rock solid and super stable. So not only are we um, being able to interrogate the interior uh, event stream of the browser, um, which we can use to do our normal weights and our normal things, which we could always do before, but which we can do um, in a slightly more integrated way with the CDP. We also have these capabilities that allow people to write their tests once and have it be more stable and more coherent. The other thing that Selenium IDE offers um, and it already offers this, is um, the ability for you to add your own plugins and extensions. So we have a tool, and it's great, and it's lovely, but no tool does everything that is entirely, um, uh, entirely correct for your testing purposes. There's always going to be something that is specific about your setup. Um, examples of extensions may be things to make finding elements by React um, simpler, or um, other, other capabilities. Uh, the other major feature is code export. So we know that when you record your tests in Selenium IDE, that is quite often the first 
part of a path toward writing a full test suite. So any my IDE is fantastic, but quite often your developers are going to be writing in Java, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, some other programming language. So what we'd like to be able to do is take the test that's been recorded and export it. And the code export features allow this already. You can find the code export for Java um, and Python is um, basically there right now as well. We are going through the code export uh, features in the order of the priority that people have told us. So we've listened to our users and they've said, we need this first and we need that. Um, so Peter Walsh is saying, your lack of a seatbelt is making me nervous. Um, I am in my car, that is correct. I've just been to my son's parents' evening. We are parked up and completely stationary. I'm not going anywhere. It is perfectly safe. Um, the, the car is not moving. So moving on um, to WebDriver. You've recorded your tests, you've exported them. You probably want to be using the WebDriver APIs. Um, there are some new features coming. The friendly locators, which I will cover, the Chrome debugging protocol. Um, and uh, the major one is the W3C protocol. Let's see if I can move. The reason why we're doing the Selenium 4 upgrade, and we're calling it Selenium 4 and not Selenium 3. Point whatever the next digit of Pi is, um, is because we are wholeheartedly adopting the W3C web driver protocol. This is the protocol that we spent the past six years working on. It's been a standard for about a year now. Um, and it is fractionally different from the original uh, protocol, which we refer to as the JSON wire protocol within the project. The major differences are around how you create a new session and um, how you can do element interactions using the Actions API. The major difference with the Actions API is that you can now do multiple actions simultaneously. So you can do things like multi-touch, you can do um, pressing two keys simultaneously, you can do cording, and at the same time, click with the mouse, um, things like that. So it's a far richer API that we have offered. Um, and the reason why we're doing it is the W3C protocol um, is, is what we're using. What does that mean for users? I'll be honest, hopefully, probably nothing. If you're just using the WebDriver APIs, the APIs are remaining stable, they're remaining consistent. All that's happening is the wire protocol is changing. Now, um, versions of Selenium uh, since 3.8 have spoken both the JSON wire protocol and the W3C protocol. Um, so even as things change, from your point of view as a person writing the tests, nothing has changed. So although we're doing this big change and we're debumping the version number, um, the differences are at the wire protocol level and not at the API level. So who does care about protocol dialects? Well, Selenium as a service provider, such as Browser Stack. Um, one of the nice things is that we have a good community around the project. Um, and I've made a special point of going out and talking to um, people such as Browser Stack, who are kindly hosting this, um, to make sure that when the Selenium 4 comes out, your tests are going to continue running on their infrastructure um, just as stably and just as well as they've always done before. So like I said, there are stable user-facing APIs. If you've been writing Selenium tests using the WebDriver APIs, you should just find this to be a drop-in upgrade. Um, having said that, there are some caveats. Um, the major one is that if an API was marked as deprecated, um, it may well be gone. Uh, normally, this shouldn't be affecting you because who writes tests using deprecated APIs? Um, and you can catch those points by recompiling your code right now with deprecation being not just a warning, but an error. Um, and quite often, the, the, the mechanisms for upgrading are simple and easy. Uh, in many cases, what we've done is we've moved classes from an internal package to a better top-level package um, and made them publicly available. Um, and so that's really nice. In other cases, we are marking things deprecated because we will be changing how things work. The major one for that is that people quite often take a web driver and they cast it to something like finds by CSS selector, finds by ID, or finds by name. The appropriate thing to do is to always use um, the find, find element API and pass in a locator, such as um, by ID, by, by CSS, so on and so forth. 
Um, they are functionally equivalent, but one of them is supported and one of them uses APIs that we consider to be private to uh, Selenium itself. Um, so just be aware of that fact. And where you find yourself casting a web driver or a web element to one of those sub, uh, sub interfaces, finds by CSS selector, finds by ID, um, prefer to use find element with by ID, by CSS, um, by name, so on and so forth. The major language bindings for every language other than Java are going to be speaking straight W3C protocol. They will be pulling out um, support for the JSON wire protocol. That allows them to simplify their code. It allows it to be more maintainable and it allows it to be easier for them to, to continue iterating on the frameworks that you use, that you, that you are familiar with and you are comfortable with. However, we are fully aware on the project that there are some people um, who, for whatever reason, will want to use the old JSON wire protocol. Um, maybe they're using a third party library um, that just isn't, hasn't been upgraded yet. Uh, maybe they're stuck with an old version of Firefox. There are loads of people using the legacy Firefox driver for some reason. Um, and we want to continue to support them. In order to support them, the Java bindings and the Selenium server will provide mechanisms for people to use the old JSON wire protocol. So uh, what you may find is that if you are using, um, say, the Ruby or the JavaScript bindings or the .NET bindings, and you want to take advantage of uh, the legacy Firefox driver, then you may need to stand up the Selenium server in the middle of your tests. But you may well be doing that right now. And if you're using Selenium Grid, that's also possible. The um, preservation of backward compatibility is something the project is super, super um, dedicated to. In fact, right now, what you can do, and somebody on the mailing list actually tried this recently, um, you can take a Selenium RC 1.0 test, so Selenium 1, and you can run it against the current Selenium grid. Um, and we have protocol converters that convert from the original Selenium RC uh, uh, language bindings um, all the way through to the latest, greatest W3C wire dialect. Um, so we will continue having that backwards, uh, backward compatibility because we know that you have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of dedication building up your test suites, making sure they're rock solid, making sure they're capable. And the last thing we want to do is pull the rug out from underneath you. Your tests are an, exist are an investment that you have made. So we are trying to make it so that your upgrades are as smooth and as simple as possible. So like I said, .NET, JavaScript, Ruby, and Python, um, which are all the language bindings that um, we support in the project other than Java, will be W3C only. Um, like I said before, the user-facing APIs are stable. They are not changing radically. Um, we are just taking the opportunity to remove deprecated methods, deprecated classes. Um, so hopefully for you, it'll just be a case of going to your, um, your, gem, fi your, your, your gem file for bundler, um, your Python config, your, uh, your, your, um, even, even your Maven, uh, configs and just upgrading from 3.141 to 4.0 and magically everything will continue working. Um, the only people who need to care are people who need that backward compatibility for some reason. And the major reason will be because either infrastructure hasn't been upgraded and it will need to be pretty old infrastructure because Selenium Grid supports um, both protocols natively at the moment. Um, Either uh, uh, things need to be upgraded or you're using the legacy Firefox driver. In either case, you can use the Java bindings either directly or through the Selenium server, and they will enable you to use the JSON wire protocol. So even though we're making this fairly radical change, we are providing mechanisms for the uh, legacy protocol to continue working. So like I said, does this change the wire protocol matter? Do the deprecations matter? Probably not, I'll be honest with you. Um, the reasons, like I've said, is that the uh, user-facing APIs, we're either adding new APIs um, or we are removing APIs that have been clearly marked as being deprecated. And the policy on the project has always been that we will mark a, an API as being deprecated and then we can remove it um, at any later version. 
So one of the nice things is that right now, all of the third party uh, drivers, Gecko driver, Chrome driver, um, both kinds of the Microsoft web driver for, for Edge, um, the Opera driver, so on and so forth, all of those use the W3C protocol already. So all of the, um, dry, all the browsers that you're trying to use already speak the W3C protocol. So all you need to do is keep on upgrading those and everything will carry on working. That is a huge accomplishment and I am incredibly pleased. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the browser teams have been working super hard on this. Um, the Chrome driver folks uh, have only recently managed to, to, to land all the changes, but they have done it and it's fantastic. And they've done it with really active involvement um, with the community. Jim Evans helped them a lot um, and they listened to him filing bug reports and acted upon it super quickly. Couldn't be happier. It's such a, an amazing achievement. So um, I said we're going to be adding various bits and pieces. Um, one of those bits and pieces is uh, new APIs. Now, we always know that finding elements is hard, right? The provided by implementations are fairly limited, and they're really technical. ID, CSS, name, these are things that are sort of deep down in the structure of the DOM. And what we're thinking of doing is adding friendly locators. Now, friendly locators are an idea that I first saw implemented in a project called Sahi, which was written, um, uh, came out of ThoughtWorks India, and uh, Narayan uh, wrote it. And it, it was a lovely piece of kit. But one of the nice things it has is its ability to uh, find things that are near or above, below, left of, right of. Um, it offered sort of a, a sort of positional way of finding elements. Um, this has come to light more recently in projects such as Tyco from ThoughtWorks, um, which calls them relative locators. So the idea started in Sahi, but it's already um, available in seven, several different frameworks. And it would be nice if we could offer it in Selenium as well. If you were to download the Selenium 4 Alpha, you will not find friendly locators yet. I need to write the code. Um, it's not quite ready to share with the world, but it should be in probably alpha two, maybe alpha three, um, depending on how solid we feel it is. Um, but this will allow you to do uh, tests where you find elements to the left of, uh, find the, the checkbox to the left of this label. Um, find the, uh, um, uh, the radio button below this. Um, you can write in, in um, a nice sort of simple way that reads really well um, and it is a bit more comprehensible and hopefully a bit more robust. Um, there's a question coming in saying, is it to support Angular ap applications? Not specifically. It's there to support people writing tests. We know that element locators can be super hard to write, super brittle, super hard to maintain. So we want to make that as easy as possible for people. Selenium Grid is being more modernized. Um, we noticed the fact that sort of the original Selenium grid um, has aged a bit and we want to take advantage of uh, some of the uh, features that have come out since we originally released it. In particular, Docker, um, the ability to scale out using cloud infrastructure um, and the rise of observability. So the original Selenium grid or the grid that we ship now is we came uh, as part of Selenium 2. Um, and that was released in 2011. It came out of work that Francois Reynard had done at eBay, um, which they donated to the project. And 2011 was a really long time ago. It was eight years ago. Um, and the world has moved on. Back in 2011, we'd have been lucky if we had um, more than three or four machines to run it on. Um, they tend to be... Um, <clears throat> They tended to uh, be servers running something like VMware. Um, starting a new virtual machine was a heavyweight process. It was difficult. Um, and our farms tended to be small. Right now, we can use Docker to spin up um, new virtual images incredibly quickly. It takes milliseconds instead of tens of seconds. Um, and even more, even more um, pleasantly, we can use things like Kubernetes to allow us to deploy into the cloud and scale um, horizontally, basically in an almost unlimited way. So the world has moved on since 2011. 
like I say, there's Docker now, which has allowed us to take um, uh, simple browser images, run them, and throw them away as necessary. It's made virtual machines basically free to use and effectively disposable. Um, tooling like Kubernetes allows people to set up a, a, a grid of machines a lot more simply and a lot more lightweight. Um, of course, running Kubernetes on private hardware is a bit of a pain in the backside. And things like AWS, GCP, Azure are out there. We want your grid to take advantage of that. Um, so uh, what have we done to change uh, Selenium in order to support your tests? Well, the first step was acknowledging the fact that there are tools out there that already offer this. Selenium is excellent. Um, it's a fantastic piece of kit that it gives you already Docker support, Kubernetes, and a really nice UI. There are other tools such as Selenoid that show us that Docker um, is a great way of allowing you to scale your grid um, and keeps machine management, management and browser management simple. And one of the things that we could do is take the ideas of Selenium, of Selenium and merge them into Selenium Grid. The problem is the Selenium Grid 2 code base isn't really set up to make that particularly easy. Um, like I said, it's eight years old. And if you take a look at the way that we merged um, the original Selenium server and the Selenium Grid project, it wasn't particularly elegant. At the moment, what happens is when you start up the Selenium standalone server, it goes down one of two code paths. And we haven't really merged the two separate code bases very well at all. Um, and so we could have added Docker support, but then we wouldn't have addressed the sort of fundamental problem of the sort of bifurcated code base. And we need to do better. There are bits in the Selenium Grid code base that are better than the um, original Selenium server code base. There are abstractions in the Selenium server code bases that would make writing Grid easier. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to go from Selenium Grid 2 to Selenium Grid 4, largely because we can't count. Um, and we're going to re-architect bits and pieces about this. Um, question uh, coming in about, do you need to worry about changes in Selenium Grid? I hope that uh, this question will answer it for you. So the new Selenium Grid architecture looks like this. There are effectively four separate processes. Um, there is a router, and the router is where your messages come in and they hit the um, application, they hit the Selenium Grid. So let's imagine a new session request comes in. The new session request needs to go somewhere, so it goes to the distributor. The distributor has a list of all the nodes that are currently running in the system. Um, and so what it does is it selects the perfect node to run your test on and then starts a session on that node. The node uh, then replies to the distributor. The distributor makes a note of the URL of the node in the session app, um, and then control is returned to the user um, by responding to the new session with the um, session capabilities. Now, this sounds really complicated, but it's basically what we're doing now um, in Selenium Grid. In uh, the standalone server, the router, the session map, the distributor, and the node are a single process. In Selenium Grid, as it stands right now, uh, you will find that <clears throat> the router, the session map, and the distributor are the hub process, and the node is the node, um, which uh, is just a different way of thinking about it. So what we've done is we've broken these pieces out. Now, one of the other things that's really interesting is when the next command comes in after your new session, we can do something a bit different. What we do is we can go off to the session map and we can try and identify the node that the test is running on. And then we can talk directly to the node. Um, this means that we can scale horizontally a lot more easily. Um, for example, if we just keep a, a cache in the router of known uh, session UIDs uh, to, to the URLs, we don't even need the session map. So we can have the, the router just be a new instance of effectively a Lambda doing a router uh, routing. Session map can be running on something such as Redis. Um, and the distributor could be um, a simple sort of leader follower group in a, in a Kubernetes pod. Um, nodes can then be spun up using Docker. Um, 
running on permanent infrastructure um, or run any way that you think is appropriate. The final thing that we are landing inside Selenium Grid 4 is the ability to be observable. Um, so I'm sure all of you have heard about DevOps before. Um, running infrastructure such as a grid is a huge commitment. It's incredibly difficult. And that's why there are companies such as Browser Stack. Um, <clears throat> companies such as Browser Stack offering the ability to use Selenium as a service. Like ideally, you would never manage any of this stuff yourself, right? But if you do, you want to make the management as simple and as lightweight as possible. One of the problems with distributed architectures and microservices and things like that is they're incredibly hard to debug. It's hard to figure out what's going on. It's hard to figure out why things fail. Um, and it's really hard just to sort of track stuff down. Fortunately, things have been improving. Tooling such as open tracing have made distributed traces available to the rest of us. Um, there is a Q&A window for questions, by the way, folks. So if you do have a question, um, I will answer it, uh, hopefully later, um, relatively soon, in fact, um, and before the end of this talk. So observability um, is a mechanism to allow us to, to track what's going on. And effectively, what happens is, as the requests come in, um, each of these arrows from um, node to node gets decorated with a trace ID. And you can track what's going on. Um, and then they get collected in tooling such as um, Uber's Jaeger is a really popular tool for doing this. Zipkin is another one. You can visualize what's going on and you can prepare a heat map of um, what's been happening and you can track what's going on. Um, and so debugging a modern grid, Selenium 4 grid, will be a lot simpler. And your DevOps people, well, they're not going to high five you, um, but they're going to be very happy. So to recap, why are we doing the major version number bump? So there are many, many reasons. The uh, new IDE is worthy of a um, version number bump in and of itself. It's a huge piece of work. And we have to say thank you to all the people who have poured effort into bringing it from um, part of the project that was moribund and that was very difficult um, for us to improve to something that is actually really impressive nowadays. Um, and when we ship the Electron version, it'll be even better. We're doing the version bump as well because of the um, changes to, to WebDriver. It's still got the same familiar user-facing APIs that you're used to, um, but with a few additions. It's got integration with the Chrome debugging protocol. Um, it's got the new friendly locators. And under the hood, in a way that most of you will hopefully never see, it will be speaking only the W3C WebDriver wire protocol. Um, that's super important. And then finally, we're doing the version bump um, because we're introducing Selenium Grid. We're rewriting it, and we're modernizing it. Um, <clears throat> even right now, when you download the Selenium server, you effectively have a grid of one. But there's a bifurcated code base. Um, and we're going to be improving that by merging the code bases, re-architecting things, cleaning it up, and coming up with simpler abstractions. So hopefully, the Selenium server binary will become smaller as well. The cleaner code base will make it easier for people to contribute. Oh, and by the way, Selenium is an open source project. If there's something you don't like about it, if there's something you're excited about, if there's something you'd like to work on, um, then please come along and give us a hand. There is an active Slack channel. Um, that we have, which is linked to from the Selenium website. Uh, and if you go there, then you will find the core maintainers who are available, who can help. Um, and then um, we, would, we would love our help. We would love your help. We'd love your PRs. We are getting better at doing it. Um, and, you know, just to give you an idea, there are two of us working on the Java bindings. There's one person working on .NET. Um, two people working on Python, and only about three or four people working on Ruby, and one person working on JavaScript. Like Selenium could really do with your help. Um, so that is skimming over um, the changes that are coming in um, Selenium 4, and I will hand over to um, let you all hear more about Selenium 4 and Browser Stack itself. Praveen. Awesome, great. 
Th- thanks a lot, uh, Simon. Uh, so, folks, I'm just going to spend a quick five, ten minutes talking a little bit about browser stack and uh, then also show you uh, sort of what are the changes uh, you need to make uh, in order to pass W3C capabilities uh, and also show you sort of a capability configurator or builder that we have internally uh, that you guys can use off our website to uh, configure your capabilities uh, to be W3C compliant. So just a little history uh, about browser stack for many of you who might not have uh, heard of us. Um, so we've been around for eight years now. Um, we, we got our sort of official launch in 2011. Uh, our first product was, uh, you know, uh, IE. Uh, you know, we were allowing users to test IE from their Macs. So that's how we started. Uh, that was the problem that our founders were trying to solve. Uh, we hit our first thousand customers in, in 2012 uh, in about a year, or a little less than a year. And, uh, you know, today uh, we have, uh, you know, 2 million users across 135 countries. Uh, we have four products. So we, you know, the, the product that's sort of being discussed today is, is Automate. So that's our Selenium uh, testing product on desktop and mobile browsers, uh, real mobile devices. Uh, we've got Live, which is our interactive web-based uh, browser testing product. And uh, last year we launched a couple of uh, app testing products. So similar to Automate, we now also allow or, or you know, let you test your mobile apps uh, using a variety of frameworks like Appium, um, Earl Grey, Espresso, and XUI. And uh, like Live, we have interactive mobile app testing. So you can test your mobile apps, uh, you know, on iOS and Android devices. And uh, yeah, we've, we've uh, you know, crossed 25,000 customers. These are some of the brands that uh, use our platform. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also got uh, a lot of open source projects like jQuery, um, Discord, uh, using us. So, um, you know, happy to sort of, uh, you know, if, if you're working on an open source project and you need um, help testing it out, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to help you out. Uh, so let me just sort of quickly uh, move to, uh, you know, what is the impact of Selenium 4 or W3C on, on browser stack uh, or on your test on browser stack? So to answer your question, you know, will my test break? Uh, short answer is no your test will continue to work. Um, like Simon said, you know, backward compatibility uh, is sort of one of the key things. We don't want your test to suddenly stop working. Uh, but, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to update our test suites, uh, to start using uh, WTC compliant uh, capabilities. Uh, so I'm just gonna walk through a couple of examples with you guys uh, on, on what this looks like. Uh, and then I'll sort of dive into our website and show you how you can do that. So. Some of the key changes, uh, you know, between JSON Wire and W3C, uh, just, you know, basic sort of changes in the way you, you name your capabilities. Um, these are some of the browse stack specific capabilities. Again, all of this is in the documentation. We'll share links out uh, with you guys after this webinar, uh, along with the video recording. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, so this is in Java uh, using JSON Wire. Um, you know, so you can see the capabilities on top and the browse stack specific capabilities such as browse stack dot local and debug, uh, you know, in line 40, 41, 42. Um, and uh, you will see in the sort of the command line that it says OSS. Um, now, all I need to do, uh, you know, to switch this to W3C is, uh, you know, make these changes. Uh, and uh, the key thing here is to uh, understand that, you know, now you're passing all of your capabilities through bstack uh, colon options. So you need to sort of uh, put your capabilities in there, uh, you know, with the new sort of uh, naming conventions um, and, and pass it through uh, vstack colon options. And it will tell you uh, you are using uh, W3C as a protocol, right? So it's, it's very simple uh, going from um, JSON wire to W3C and I'll show you how to do that uh, using our, our capability builder tool. Um, here's another sample. I'm just running a test now on a real device. Uh, so I'm running this test on um, the iPhone XS. Uh, same, same sort of concept uh, using vstack colon options. Um, and I am just gonna sort of exit out of the presentation and show you how you can do this from our website. So there is a page called uh, bustactor.com slash automate slash capabilities. Again, we'll share the link with you. So we've got two tabs here. Uh, we call this tool the capability generator. It's available to all of you to use. So this is my legacy or JSON wire protocol. Uh, so I can basically go in here and pick uh, you know, what browser operating system um, I want to test on. And you will see the capabilities getting updated on the right-hand side. Um, now, if I want to switch to W3C, I just click on this tab. 
and uh, you know it starts putting in uh, capabilities here in in the sort of the W3C compliant format, and I can just switch between languages here. Uh, it will show me you know how to pass these capabilities in my uh, in my test suites. So very very simple, right? So as I make changes here, um, you know you will see it getting updated on the right. So that's that's basically it. You know, so you just need to sort of uh, enter your capabilities here using a selector. Uh, they will be generated in the language of your choice here. And then you can just copy and paste this into your test suites. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to the slide deck now. <clears throat> And I talked about this. Um, I will now stop and uh, we can handle some questions. That would help, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I've just been having a quick look at some of the questions um, and there are some themes. Um, the first one is people are worried about the fact I'm I'm in a car. Um, the reason is I have just been to my son's uh, school parents' evening, and I either had to drive at unsafe speeds back to London, um, or I sat in the car park of his school um, and did it there. So rather than do something dangerous, I thought I would just sit uh, somewhere safe and do it. Um, and there was no way I'm going to miss my son's parents' evening, right? So. Uh, education is super important, and, and I believe that. Um, second theme of the questions are people asking for dates of when we're going to do things. Um, we always joke that we will do a release um, with Selenium 3, it's by Christmas. Uh, with Selenium 4, it's by Chinese New Year. But we never really mention which year it's going to be. Um, and that's because we're an open source project. We're going as fast as we can, but there is literally no one um, in the in the team working on the sort of um, the language bindings who is paid to work on Selenium. We all do it in our spare time when we have the capacity to do it. Um, and you know, if you go back when we started this in two thousand and seven, um, if you go back twelve years, then you know, we were all younger, we had more time, um, and we had uh, more more energy, basically, and we could do this a lot faster. Right now, we do it when we can. Um, ETA, hopefully Chinese New Year, um, I want it to come out as soon as possible. The language bindings, other than Java, um, are in pretty good shape. Um, we need to land the building blocks for the friendly locators so they could be used by everyone. Um, but it won't take long for everyone to do that. And the Chrome debugging protocol integration um, is also coming. So the ETA is as soon as possible, but no sooner. Um, there are also questions about like, will the grid support video playback? Um, this is one of the features that is really nice in Solanium um, and also in Solenoid and other products. And I think it's something that people have come to expect as sort of table stakes for us to integrate. Um, so if you would like to send a PR that will help us integrate that, I will merge it pronto. Otherwise, yes, it is a fan feature. No, I don't know when I will get to it, um, but I will get to it as soon as I can. And I keep saying, hey, look, send us a PR. Feel free to contribute. Um, contributing seems daunting, but it's actually not that bad. The first thing to do is to go to GitHub, um, fork the project and download your clone. Um, the second thing to do is to open up your IDE of choice and start hacking on the code. Um, everything is set up to run if you're using Java um, within IntelliJ and there's a free community version of that so you don't need to, to spend any money to do that. Um, and we check in the, the configs for it. There are also Visual Studio um, uh, declarations for .NET and uh, you can use your favorite editor for the Ruby and the Python bindings. So just download the code, fork it, start hacking on it. Um, if you can write a test for a new feature, that would be amazing. Uh, feel free to copy and paste one of the existing tests in your language of choice, and then away you go. Um, and uh, that's great. 
if you get stuck, if you need help, if you're not familiar with the architecture, if you really don't know how anything works, then just come along to the Slack channel. The Slack channel is where the core developers hang out. Um, you can ask us and one of us will come and help you. Um, also, my DMs are open on Twitter. You can always ping me and I will try and answer helpfully and rapidly. Um, PHP WebDriver, which is maintained by Facebook, won't get any of this right. Um, the, uh, I need to contact the PHP WebDriver developers. They know that the W3C changes are coming down the track. Um, if they don't do anything, if they don't have an opportunity to uh, update things, then um, what they can do is uh, they can do nothing and whoever runs PHP WebDriver can use the Selenium server in order to um, get support for the legacy protocol. Uh, going through friendly locators, what about things in the shadow DOM? I don't know is the answer for that. There was a very specific question uh, from Sani, which was when a Selenium test fails due to an element not being there or an element not having the correct attributes, the real work starts finding out what went wrong. Currently, the only real data we can use is screenshots and videos. Selenium alternatives like Cypress allow you to go back in time and inspect the DOM tree as it was during testing. These kinds of features are huge time savers when debugging test failures. Will Selenium offer these types of features in the future, or do you know of any third party tools that do? Um, so Selenium already offers this as a capability. Um, it's one of the reasons why we wrote the tooling um, that we did. Uh, the way that you do it isn't particularly clear. So when I wrote Selenium in the first place, when I wrote the WebDriver APIs, what I expected was it was going to be like the machine code of the internet, of, of browser automation, right? It was going to be this library and you could build tools on top of it um, and people would build the abstractions that they were found most appropriate for their testing. Um, and when I realized that people were using the raw API, um, I helped popularize the idea of the page object pattern. Um, Antony Marcono came out with um, a screenplay pattern as well. There are, there are these various approaches. Um, and my, my thinking was that people were going to do um, more object-oriented development, and they would very rarely use the WebDriver APIs directly. Um, that isn't correct. And that's one of the reasons why we're putting things like friendly locators into Selenium 4. However, buried in the, in the depths of um, most of the driver implementations, uh, language bindings, there is a class called event, event firing web driver or something like that, which will take um, an existing web driver and will fire events as exciting things happen. Um, if you wanted to, for example, uh, grab uh, the DOM for every action, then you would use the event firing web driver and you would just grab the DOM after every interaction and store them in a file. Like the raw capabilities are there. Um, it's pretty clear to me that what we need to do is provide a better support library um, to help people take advantage of that. Um, and so uh, if somebody wants to send some patches and send some um, suggestions on nice tooling to do that, we can reify that in a, in a sort of slightly clearer way. But I'll be clear, those capabilities have been present in Selenium for quite some time if you were willing to do the work yourself. And it's clear to me that the thing that we, would, we didn't do successfully as a project was make it clear how simple some of this stuff could be. Um, and I apologize for that because clearly some of you have been suffering. Um, and that's not a good thing. Um, Praveen, did you want to take any questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going to quit the presentation. I'm able to see the questions. Uh, give me a sec here. So I think uh, there were some questions around, uh, uh, one was around uh, open source with browser stack. Uh, so I think if you are working on an open source project, any open source project, uh, and uh, you need, you know, uh, browser stack to be able to test uh, your project on different websites or mobile apps, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, so you can go to browsetag.com slash open hyphen source um, or just, uh, you know, send an email to support at browsetag.com. Um, all we need is uh, an active project uh, on GitHub or, or any other uh, uh, sort of uh, management tool uh, that 
that we can look at and know that it's open source. Uh, that's the only thing we ask. Uh, and then we will give you a fully featured uh, version of Broad Stack, uh, whether it's live uh, manual testing or automated testing. Uh, there were a couple of folks who asked about um, security uh, and I think somebody asked about HIPAA compliance. So that's not something that's relevant to us. Uh, however, we are SOC 2, GDPR, and Privacy Shield uh, certified. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, to whatever extent it's possible to get the certifications, uh, we have done that. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, feel free to again reach out to us uh, uh, on through our website if you have more questions about security. Um, I will also send out an email, uh, you know, post this with a link to our security page where you can look at all the different, uh, uh, you know, things that we're certified with. A uh, couple of folks asked about um, uh, real devices. Um, so, uh, you know, is it, um, you know, I think people are asking whether it's, uh, it's, is it a real device? So yes, they are actually real devices. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't use emulators. So uh, we've got data centers uh, uh, around the world and, um, uh, you know, so they are actual real iOS and Android devices that we have in our own data centers. Uh, you are being connected uh, to those devices. Um, what else? Oh, let me just go through. So um, there was a question about like, are we working with the people who are implementing the W the W three C protocol, and how do we ensure that everyone implements it equally? Um, with the browser vendors, they are all members of the W three C, and they are implementing the W three C specification, which is at w three c dot org slash tr slash webdriver. Um, there is a suite of tests called the web platform tests, and there are a significant number of Selenium tests in there um, to a, a web driver test to, to verify that browsers implement the protocol correctly. Um, also, I am talking to people such as Browser Stack to ensure that sort of when Selenium 4 comes out, everyone is ready. And I've been re really happy just working with Browser Stack to help make that happen. Um, Praveen, I'll, I'll let you carry on talking. Sure, thanks, thanks, Simon. Uh, so I think uh, there were some questions around uh, how long we will support um, uh, the legacy protocol. So I mean, you know, I think we, we have no plans to stop uh, stop support for that. Like I think like Simon mentioned in his presentation, uh, we want to make sure that your tests uh, don't break and we're going to give you as much time as possible. So, you know, I don't think that's something you need to worry about right now. Um, what else? I think Simon, uh, there were some questions around um, features like uh, downloads, HTML5 uploads. Um, uh, any any updates you can give around that? Uh, so uh, downloads is 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 a is an interesting question. Um, the one of the the things that people that the project has for a long time recommended is that people don't test file downloads. Um, like if a web browser can't download a file, then the web browser itself is useless, right? We know that web browsers can download files. Um, what we do want to be able to do is verify that when you go to this URL, then the correct file is generated, right? And that isn't an end-to-end -end test. That is more of a, um, an integration test uh, that you can write. Um, and perhaps you use curl if you were super keen to, to, hire it, uh, to hook everything together. Having said that, um, there are things you can do to force browsers to set a default down download directory um, where things are downloaded automatically. Sadly, that is browser dependence. So you need to figure out the correct flags to pass. Um, but you can make that work if you really need to. Um, but generally, testing that browsers can download files from the internet is somewhat redundant. Um, I know I'm being flippant, and I know um, that some of you have actual hard requirements, which is why there are the abilities to set the download directories directly. Um, if you are using a browser based on Chromium and you're using Selenium 4, um, the CDP integration, the Chrome Debugging Protocol integration, um, will enable you to take advantage of the underlying protocol uh, commands in the, in the Chrome Debugging Protocol to enable you to set the download directory. Um, now, I should point out that that sort of capability is really useful when you're running on localhost. But once you're running on grid, once your test is no longer running uh, on the same machine as the browser, then things get um, a little bit tricky. And I'm not sure how um, companies such as, as Browser Stack would, would handle that. 
Mm. Um, desired capabilities is deprecated. I see a lot of questions about this in the Java world um, and in the .NET world. And in fact, in all of the things, we are encouraging people, um, if they're instantiating a particular browser, to use the options classes for that. So there's a Firefox options, um, an Internet Explorer options, an Edge options, uh, so on and so forth in most of the language bindings. Um, and they give you a strongly typed API that you can use to set capabilities as you need to. If, however, you're using um, Grid or using Browser Stack, then you can use mutable capabilities um, to set up what you need to do. Um, and there are also immutable capabilities, which are capabilities you cannot change. Uh, which take a map, and which you can use to construct things. Um, so either set the options that are specific for the browser using the specific subclasses for each browser, um, or use something like mutable capabilities. And I can't remember for the life of me what the .NET equivalent of mutable capabilities is, but there is something. Yeah, and uh, I think, yeah, I saw a lot of questions around that. So we will be updating the, the, the builder. We're in the process of, uh, of adding that uh, and, and changing it to, to mutable capabilities. So we'll, we'll make sure that that gets done soon. Uh, I think, Simon, there was a question, a couple of questions on how to join the Snack channel or what the link was to that um, uh, for the Selenium project. Okay. Um, so if you go to um, the Selenium HQ website, then you can go to the support uh, area and there is a link so you can get an invitation to join the Slack channel directly from there. Um, I think, I don't use Slack very often. I use, I use IRC in order to figure out all these things. Otherwise I would tell you it's something like selenimhq.slack.com um, is the, the, the Slack channel, I believe. Um, but the actual link itself is, is on the uh, support section of the um, uh, of the website um, at salonohq.org slash support. Um, and somebody in the uh, Zoom webinar chat has very kindly um, posted a link to the Slack channel invitation. Um, so if you want to join the Slack right now, you can just jump there um, and, and join in the fun. Awesome. Let me just go through. I think there were some questions around uh, just general support related questions. So guys, I, I uh, encourage you to just reach out to our support team. They're very, very responsive. Uh, so they will be able to sort of help you, uh, you know, just troubleshoot issues. I think somebody asked about Firefox and local. So uh, just reach out to our support team and they'll be happy to help you. Uh, let me just see. Uh... Simon, uh, I think a couple of people were asking about um, I know this is not exactly your uh, area, but uh, the people who are asking about Appium uh, and sort of yeah. the impact of uh, W3C uh, and Selenium 4 on, on Appium. So, so um, I met up with Jonathan Lips, who is the lead of the Appium project recently. Uh, we're having a chat. He tells me that Appium already supports the W3C protocol. Um, so that's great news. Um, I think there are sub-projects that, that Appium uses to control specific things like Equi Web Driver Agent and um, other bits and pieces. I think they're being updated to also support the W3C protocol, um, which is great news. Great. So uh, the official line is it supports the W3C protocol. Great. All right. Um, I don't see other specific questions. I think what we will do after the webinar also is we'll go through the entire list of questions. Uh, make sure we reach out uh, to you guys um, and make sure that we share answers to whatever we couldn't uh, answer during this session. Um, I think I think we'll start wrapping up now. Um, Simon, thanks a lot again uh, for, for taking the time uh, and, and working with us to, to host this webinar. Uh, and, and thank you everyone uh, from around the world for joining. Uh, I think we've we hit 400 plus participants uh, at one point in the webinar. So I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone taking the time uh, to join us. Um, uh, like I said, uh, you know, we will be emailing uh, everyone, um, you know, anybody, everyone who registered for the webinar with a link to the recording. Um, and uh, we'll address all the questions that were asked uh, during this webinar. Uh, and uh, we will also share the uh, slides that we used uh, during this webinar. So I think uh, that is uh, pretty much it. Uh, thanks a lot, Simon, again. Um, have a great day. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone else, for joining. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone.